In the ancient land of Egypt, the Narmer Palad tells a tale of a mighty king, Narmer, who sought to unite the fragmented realms under the divine gaze of his gods. Crafted in the era around 3200 to 3000 BCE, this ceremonial engraving was long believed to be a historical record of Egypt's unification under Narmer, the inaugural ruler of the first dynasty. Yet, modern scholars, the storytellers of our time, now weave a different narrative. They suggest that Narmer, also known as Menes, might not have forcefully unified the land. Instead, the palette is seen as a symbolic masterpiece, portraying the cultural importance of a king as a valiant warrior. Regardless of the means, Narmer is celebrated as a conqueror in the eyes of the ancient Egyptians. Unlike the great kings of Mesopotamia, such as the formidable Assyrian rulers who left behind inscriptions chronicling their military exploits, the early records of Egyptian warfare speak of civil unrest. The Egyptians, stewards of the most perfect land, were less driven by the desire for conquest and more by the preservation of their cherished homeland. This prevailing theme persisted from the early dynastic period through the Old Kingdom. In the days of the Old Kingdom, the central government turned to regional governors, known as nomarchs, to raise armies. These nomarchs, leaders of their districts, conscripted soldiers and sent them forth, each bearing the emblem of their homeland. Loyalties were divided among communities, brothers-in-arms, and the nomarch, leading to a decentralized militia. Successful campaigns in Nubia, Syria, and Palestine were orchestrated not by a united Egyptian force, but by smaller units with varying allegiances. As the power of nomarchs swelled, the old kingdom crumbled, giving way to the first intermediate period. The central government, once seated in Memphis, lost relevance as nomarchs assumed control, building temples in their honor. In a bid to restore prestige, the capital moved to Heracleopolis, but the king's authority remained elusive. The winds of change blew with Mentehotep, the second of Thebes, who overthrew the ineffective rulers and ushered in the Middle Kingdom. Leading an army from Thebes, Mentehotep II might have laid the groundwork for professional soldiers. The elusive evidence suggests that professional forces could have existed even in the pre-dynastic period. A pivotal moment arrived with Amenemhat I, successor to Mentehotep II. It is believed that he forged the first standing army in Egypt, wresting power from nomarchs and consolidating it in the hands of the king. The stage was set for a new era, where the king held direct control over a loyal army, dedicated not to regional lords but to the unity of Egypt and its sovereign ruler. In the days of the Old Kingdom, the weapons of war were simple yet effective, wielded by soldiers of the lower class peasantry. Maces, daggers and spears were the tools of their trade. Clad in skull caps and bearing clan, or known totems, these soldiers were a sight to behold. They brandished maces with wooden or stone heads, and their standard gear included bows with square-tipped flint arrowheads, leather quivers, and occasionally, hides for shields. In the heat of battle, most fought barefoot, donned in simple kilts or even naked. The bow and arrow, though challenging to draw with a short range and unreliable accuracy, became a staple in the hands of these lower-class warriors. Despite their lack of training and the prohibition of hunting for the peasantry, these archers, firing in unison from close quarters, could prove formidable. After a volley or two, the soldiers would close in, armed with hand weapons, leaving the Egyptian navy to serve only as a transport for troops, not engaging the enemy. As the epochs shifted, so did the face of warfare. In the Middle Kingdom, soldiers marched with copper axes and swords, and long bronze spears became the norm. Leather body armor adorned their frames over short kilts. The army underwent a transformation, organized by a minister of war and a commander-in-chief, or an official fulfilling such a role. Professional troops emerged, highly trained and led by elite, shock troops serving as the vanguard. Officers commanded units, reporting to a higher echelon, marking a shift from the decentralized militia of the Old Kingdom. The zenith of military might arrived with the warrior king Sinisret III, the model for the legendary conqueror Sesestris. Sinisret III's reign saw the Egyptian army reach new heights. Campaigns in Nubia and Palestine were led, the position of nomarch was abolished, and direct control over regions was established. Fortifications secured Egypt's borders, and a new era of stability dawned. However, the 13th dynasty witnessed a decline in central government effectiveness, opening the door for the Hyksos, a Semitic people from Syria-Palestine. Settling in Lower Egypt at Avaris, the Hyksos amassed wealth and political power. This marked the beginning of the Second Intermediate Period, a time of division with the Hyksos in the north, 
Egyptians in the middle, and Nubians to the south. Sikhanera Tia of Thebes challenged Apepi, the Hyksis king at Avaris, sparking conflict. Eventually, Amos I of Thebes succeeded in driving the Hyksis out, ushering in the new kingdom. During the Second Intermediate Period, the Egyptian army relied heavily on Meje, Nubian warriors serving as mercenaries. These skilled warriors evolved from scouts and light infantry to formidable cavalry units. The Hyksis, despite being foreign rulers, brought innovation to Egypt's culture, especially in warfare and weaponry. They introduced the horse-drawn war chariot, a composite bow with wood reinforced by sinew and horn, a kopesh sword, and a bronze dagger. Egypt, now awakened to the possibilities of these innovations, aimed to safeguard its borders and launched the Egyptian empire under the early kings of the New Kingdom, marking the dawn of a powerful and expansive era. In the glorious era of the New Kingdom, when names like Hatshepsut, Thutmose III, Seti I, and Ramses II echoed through the corridors of time, Egypt stood at the pinnacle of prestige, power, and wealth. It was an age of imperial aspirations, where Egypt expanded its borders beyond tradition, annexing territories and controlling them for its own benefit. Military conquest, once a regular royal duty, became a permanent fixture, culminating in an era almost perpetually at war. The empire's genesis traced back to Amos I's expulsion of the Hyksis, reaching into Palestine and Syria. However, it truly burgeoned during Amenhotep I's reign, who expanded the southern borders into Nubia. Thutmose I surpassed his predecessors, campaigning through Palestine, Syria, and into Mesopotamia, reaching the mighty Euphrates River. Queen Hatshepsut extended Egyptian influence with expeditions to Nubia, Syria, and a notable trade mission to Punt. Yet, it was Thutmose III who etched his name as the greatest warrior king. Conquering Libya, expanding into Nubia, and securing the Levant, Thutmose III orchestrated 17 campaigns in 20 years, laying the foundation for the Egyptian empire. A professional army emerged, a far cry from the confederation of known levies of old. Under this new order, divisions, both chariot and infantry, each numbering around 5,000 men, bore the names of Egypt's principal deities. The army underwent a hierarchical transformation, from officers in charge of 50 soldiers, to captains overseeing troops, the chain of command ascended to fortification overseers, troop overseers, and lieutenant commanders reporting to generals. The general, in turn, answered to the Egyptian vizier and the pharaoh. The introduction of the horse-drawn chariot, courtesy of the Hyksis, revolutionized warfare. Charioteers, trained fighters and men of wealth, piloted chariots modified for speed and maneuverability. Each chariot housed a driver and a warrior clad in scale armor and a light kilt, armed with a bow, arrows, and a spear. This formidable army, at its zenith during Amenhotep III's rule, ushered in an era of unprecedented peace and prosperity. Conflict, though not entirely absent, was carefully kept away from Egypt's borders. Under Ramses II, the empire faced a monumental challenge at the Battle of Kadesh against the Hittites in 1274 BCE. Ramses II, who had shifted the capital to Per Ramses, a city he built on the former site of Avaris, invested heavily in military endeavors. A vast bronze smelting factory produced armaments, and extensive stables, exercise grounds, and repair work supported the king's chariot corps. Per Ramses was not merely a pleasure dome, but a military industrial complex. Ramses II rode into the Battle of Kadesh, leading 20,000 men across four divisions. The clash, glorified as a decisive Egyptian victory, would later be acknowledged as more of a draw. Yet, it marked a historic moment as the world's first peace treaty was signed between the Egyptian and Hittite empires in 1258 BCE, closing the chapter on a conflict that resonated across empires. As the pages turned on the grandeur of the new kingdom, the Egyptian military, once a triumphant force, faced new challenges on the open seas. The navy, a lesser known but crucial branch, saw a resurgence in importance during this era. In the Old Kingdom, it primarily served to transport infantry, and even in the Second Intermediate Period, Kamos utilized it for troop movement down the Nile. The spotlight on the navy intensified in the New Kingdom as the Sea Peoples, a mysterious coalition threatening Egypt's prosperity by sea, emerged. Ramses II, with a keen intelligence network, anticipated their invasion. Placing his navy at the Nile's mouth, he orchestrated a clever trap luring the sea peoples into a deadly confrontation. Though often portrayed as a sea battle, 
It was essentially a land battle fought on water, a testament to the Egyptians' lack of seafaring expertise. The Navy's true worth lay in its ability to intimidate potential invaders and swiftly transport land troops. Thutmose III masterfully employed the Navy in various campaigns, converting cargo ships into naval vessels for expeditions up or down the Nile. While the Navy played a crucial role in maintaining Egypt's dominance, the decline of the new kingdom under Ramses III marked the beginning of a new era. Ramses III stood as the last effective pharaoh, and after his reign, military successes waned. The subsequent rulers lacked the strength to uphold the empire, and it began to unravel. An underlying factor in this decline was Ramses II's decision to shift the capital to Per Ramses, weakening the influence of the powerful priests of Amun in Thebes. The ensuing Third Intermediate Period saw internal divisions, symbolized by Ramses XI ruling from Per Ramses and the priests of Amun asserting authority in Thebes. Egypt's once mighty navy became overshadowed by the maritime prowess of the Greek and Phoenician fleets. The introduction of iron weapons in the Iron Age II marked a technological advance, but the scarcity of trees for charcoal hindered widespread iron production. The Assyrian invasions in 671 BCE and 666 BCE showcased the superiority of iron weaponry and tactics, leading to the downfall of the once potent Egyptian military. The late period of ancient Egypt ushered in further turmoil. Greek mercenaries, employed by Egyptian rulers vying for supremacy, added a chaotic layer to the internal strife. Despite innovations like iron weapons and a robust cavalry, the Egyptian military struggled to regain its former glory. The Persian invasion in 525 BCE exploited clever tactics, with Cambyses II using the Egyptians' reverence for animals, especially cats, to secure victory. The demise of the new kingdom paved the way for Alexander the Great, who seized Egypt from the Persians in 331 BCE. After his passing, Egypt fell under the rule of Ptolemy, a Macedonian Greek general. The Ptolemaic dynasty, embracing their own military tactics, marked the end of ancient Egyptian warfare as it was once known. The innovations and progress in weaponry after 1069 BCE faded into insignificance without a robust central government to sustain the military might of ancient Egypt.